Thank you, and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Bill Alford. I'm a faculty member at Harvard Law School, and I have the pleasure on behalf of International Legal Studies at the Law School, the Harvard Law School Library, and East Asian Legal Studies to welcome you all. Uh, our library is the most comprehensive law library in the academic world and central to our mission. It often, with different programs tonight, International Legal Studies, sponsors book talks. Uh, I do want to start by thanking the library and thanking uh, Andre Barbeck and Sarah Zucker for uh, their amazing work in putting together this session. So we are here to celebrate the publication by Harvard University Press recently of, if we can see it here, Six Faces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, and Why It Matters by Anthea Roberts and Nicholas Lamp. Some brief introductions before we get to the substance. So Anthea is professor uh, at the School of Regulation and Global Governance at Australia National University in her home country. She previously taught at LSE, at Columbia Law School and Harvard Law School, wonderfully at all places. Uh, her last book is International Law International, won numerous prizes, including the 2018 American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit for the most creative contribution uh, to legal scholarship. It was the Oxford University Press's top-selling law monograph worldwide in 2017-18. Uh, Anthea previously has won many awards. She was a two-time winner of the Francis Deak Award for the best article by a young scholar from uh, American Society of International Law, uh, which by the way, Professor Slaughter, who we'll get to later, was president of. Um, and Anthea has been the recipient of a UK Philip Lieberholm Award, the Australian National University Futures Award. Uh, she is a bold and creative scholar. Her co-author, Nicholas Lamp, is a professor of law with a cross appointment in public policy at Queen's University of Canada, where he came, uh, which he came to several years, uh, after several years working on dispute settlement issues at the appellate body of the WTO. Uh, prior to that, he did his doctorate at LSE on lawmaking and the multilateral trading system. And he was honored also by the American Society for International Law uh, with its Francis Lieber Prize for scholarship regarding armed conflict. Now their book uh, is an extraordinary one. It is generously in a highly readable fashion untangles very heated debates principally, but not exclusively in the US about globalization framing them as six different faces uh, or narratives. The book, again, generously makes the best case for each of these positions, illuminating points of convergence, while also being very penetrating about their limitations the, uh, of each of these arguments. In so doing, it offers an eloquent case for how a diversity of perspectives enable us to recognize what they call the kaleidoscopic complexity of the largest problems that the globe faces, problems that are uh, constantly fluid and multifaceted in nature. At the same time, though, the book uh, is unflinchingly honest about tensions between incommensurate values about which the authors do signal their preferences toward the end. Now, fortunately, we have three absolutely terrific panelists who've agreed to comment on the book. I want to thank them. They're all very busy people. Um, and let me introduce them in alphabetical order. So they are first, Oren Cass. Uh, Oren is the founder and executive director of American Compass, whose goal is to restore an economic consensus that emphasizes the importance of family, community, and industry to the nation's liberty and prosperity. Oren is a graduate of Williams College and Harvard Law School, who is a keen and highly original observer of the impact of globalization on these very matters in family, community, and polity. Uh, as evidence, for example, in his 2018 book, The Once and Future Worker, A Vision for the Renewal of Work in America. Prior to entering Harvard Law School, Oren worked at Bain in Boston and New Delhi and Harvard Law School, where I was fortunate to have him in class. He became an officer of the Law Review and graduated magna cum laude, notwithstanding having begun even while at law school to be uh, director of domestic policy for the 2012 Romney for President campaign. One only imagines what he could have done if he were only focused on his law studies. 
Uh, Ruth Okedeji is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor at Harvard Law School, co-director of the Berkman Klein Center, and one of the world's foremost authorities on intellectual property, and particularly such crucial questions as access to vital medications and the protection of indigenous innovation, among others. Among her many accomplishments, she was one of the principal negotiators of the Marrakesh Treaty in 2013, which greatly expanded the access to copyrighted materials of persons with sight impairments. It's quite an accomplishment. In 2015, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon named Ruth to the high-level panel on access to medicine, along with the former Prime Minister of Jordan, the CEO of Oxfam, presidents of leading pharmaceutical companies and other figures of that level of consequence. Ruth, I should also note, I think relevant to today's talk is a profound scholar of law and religion and a beloved mentor to uh, hundreds upon hundreds of students here at Harvard Law School. If I can be indulged for one anecdote, I'm proud to say that she was a student in the very first class that I taught at Harvard Law School 30 odd years ago and we still debate to today who was more anxious and nervous at that time. I am absolutely certain it was me. Anyway, uh, our other panelist is uh, my dear old friend, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Uh, Anne-Marie, since 2013, has been CEO of New America, a self-described think and action tank concerned with American renewal. Uh, Anne-Marie was the J. Sinclair Armstrong Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law here at Harvard Law School from, 2000, uh, from 1994 to 2002, uh, where I also had the pleasure of teaching with her, which was mm -hmm. absolutely great. Uh, in 2002, she became Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, where she also was named a university professor. In 2009, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton named Anne-Marie Director of Policy Planning, a position held by such luminaries in this country in international affairs is George Kennan, Richard Haas, and after Anne-Marie, Jake Sullivan, who's otherwise employed these days. Uh, Anne-Marie, for her work, uh, received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award, the highest honor of the State Department, uh, particularly for her efforts in creating and leading the Quadriennial Diplomacy and Development Review, as well as Meritorious Service Awards from USAID, from the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and many, many other awards, uh, notably the Thomas Jefferson Medal from the University of Virginia, and again, many others. She's the author of, uh, I think it's still the most widely read in the history of the Atlantic, the 107 year history of the Atlantic, uh, uh, a number of years, it was 2012, um, why we still can't have it all, uh, and is the author editor of eight books, including this fall, uh, renewal, here we go, uh, renewal from crisis to transformation in our lives, work and politics from Princeton Press, which typical of her writing uses her own experience, frankly, to address and bring home in a very powerful and arresting manner issues of enormous importance to our society and our polity. So each of our three commentators will have 10 minutes uh, or so to offer uh, their thoughts about the book and some of the larger issues it stimulates. Then we'll give our authors a chance to respond. Then time permitting, I may pose a few questions of my own. I think we've agreed to go in alphabetical order. So Oren, I would turn first to you. And again, thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. I didn't know if it would be alphabetical by first or last name. So I was ready to go at any, at any moment. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I should also take the opportunity to, to thank the, the Harvard Law faculty for its forbearance as I showed up for none of my 3L courses, as you mentioned, spending, spending most of my time on the Romney campaign. I actually uh, showed up for a, a debate on healthcare moderated by, by Professor L. Haig on behalf of the Romney campaign and had to say, this is why I don't come to antitrust class, um, but but he was he was he was very kind about it, um, and and I actually wanted to to start there in in commenting on the book, which I think is a is is a, a fantastic um, contribution to this discussion about globalization and how um, seriously it takes the many different perspectives that that are out there on the issue. I, I think too much of the 
um, particularly scholarly and academic work on globalization starts from an assumption that there is one right answer and then sort of feels the need to acknowledge the existence of the other positions before sort of patting them on the head and, and sending them on their way. Uh, and, and I think this is probably the clearest delineation I've seen and, and sort of good faith sort of steel manning of, of all the different perspectives. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to comment on it. Um, I, I wanted to start with thinking back to the Romney campaign because it, for me, it has been so interesting to see how discussions about globalization shifted in particular in between 2012 and 2016. Um, and, you know, people have a sense in some ways that, well, that's just because Donald Trump won. And, and, and obviously that had something to do with it. Um, but, but for me, as someone who was so intimately involved in the policy debates in 2012, it was really stunning to see how much actually changed in our understanding of globalization in that very short period. Um, and, you know, so two examples I always cite, one that I'm proud of, one that I'm, I'm quite not proud of. Um, on the upside, I guess, you know, Governor Romney, then Governor Romney, took positions on trade with China in particular that were actually very close to what what Trump said four years later. Um, and, and he was quite aggressively, based on what you saw if you went around the country, saying this, this theory of free trade is not working in many parts of the country. Um, but it was at a point when there was no actual economic uh, analysis to support that claim. And economists were quite happy to say, no, that's just foolish populism. Free trade makes everybody better. Uh, and it was only in the next couple of years when Dater, David Otter's work on the China shock came out that people had to actually acknowledge what had been, but again, extremely obvious people actually lived in America, that something had really gone wrong here. Uh, and, and so I think that has really influenced the, the discussion. And, and then the second is, you know, the, the opioid epidemic, we just uh, today or yesterday saw again a new record um, for, for drug overdose deaths in, in a year in this country. If you look at those charts, though, you'll see they actually tend to drift back to the 90s. Um, in fact, in the year 2000, the opioid epidemic was already the um, most fatal drug epidemic ever in the United States. And in 2011 and 2012, we would get questions from out in the field, you know, spending a lot of time in New Hampshire. What people want to know is what do we have to say about the opioid epidemic? I have to confess, I confess, I literally had to Google it. O opioid? You mean like opium? Like I, I had absolutely no idea. No idea. And, and at that point, the idea that this sort of, you know, the, the hollowing out of an economy in part due to globalization, um, the idea that that had real consequences that couldn't be made up for with, with more generous transfer payments, I think, again, was just not something that people took very seriously. And um, all of the deaths of despair research also from, from Case and Deaton came out right around the same time as the China shock work. And again, made people realize just unprecedented in, in Western history and in, in, in the evolution of our economies to see um, actually life expectancy going back down for, for large groups of people and, and exactly those that, that had been affected. And so, um, you know, I, I think what, what six phases of globalization really brings to the front in a sense and how I re read it is really what are all the different reactions to those facts in a sense. Um, obviously that's, that's one small subset of, of everything that is happening, um, but it's, it is, um, I think captures well as microcosms the the major phenomena that people are trying to cope with. And so, you know, you see one view that frankly, there, there are still many people who essentially say, no, no, you know, China shock, that's just sort of a cute academic finding. It doesn't really change um, the, the case for just more free trade always. Um, there are a lot of people who look at Case and Deaton's work and say, well, technically they haven't proved causation. So who's Who's to say this is economic? It could be a cultural issue. Um, and, and so there is that view that, that really leads with the idea that, no, no, this is the right path and we should simply um, proceed down it. I think where, where I probably disagree a bit with the authors is, is with how they then present the four sides of the Rubik's Cube. So I, it, it's a wonderful, is it an analogy? Is it a metaphor? I, I don't know. Um, but, but they, they make the case that there are then opposed to the, the sort of mantra of globalization, these four different narratives that oppose it. There's, there's the left populist, the right populist, the geoeconomic, uh, and sort of the anti-corporate. And I, I think those are all correct as descriptive terms, 
But I have to say, to some extent, I have trouble telling the difference between them. Um, that, that certainly from the right of center perspective at this point, for people who have rejected the, the globalization narrative, um, all four of those cases are part of the story. I think, um, and, and I, I dislike the word populist because I think that just describes what people do in a democracy. They, they try to be popular. Um, but the, the folks on the right of center who have really said we need to rethink globalization, um, you know, they're very frustrated by the extent to which it appears to have redistributed wealth away from the American working and middle class to other parts of the world. Um, they are increasingly happy to be critical of the way it is distributed wealth upward, um, the, the inequality within the U.S., the financialization of the U.S. economy. Um, they're certainly increasingly eager to, to criticize multinational corporations. Um, and, and they're obviously very uh, concerned about, about China and, and the geoeconomic perspective. Um, I think from the left of center, it's, it's perhaps a little bit more um, nuanced. And, and that's mostly because it's not clear to me that someone like Bernie Sanders, let's say, actually belongs on the sides of the Rubik's Cube. Um, left populists, if we're, if we're going to call them that, um, at least in mainstream democratic politics, actually sound an awful lot like the globalists. Um, they have, at this point, for whatever reason, um, committed to es essentially no constraints on, on immigration. Um, they've, they've generally thrown in their lot with um, essentially more sort of openness and, and just the, the concept of openness per se being their guiding value um, and, and are very strongly committed to the idea of redistribution as, as the way to address it. So Bernie Sanders may be a populist because he wants to raise taxes, hand out money and, and give everybody health care. But that's, that is a approach entirely in keeping with full steam ahead on globalization, not actually a proposed break on it. Um, and, and so it seems to me that, that to a large extent, what we see uh, is, is really, I think, the globalization lens being a very good way to understand the realignment that's, that's happening in American politics between um, the, the, the people who are on the four sides of the Rubik's Cube, who for all their different reasons, uh, object to what's happening and see the way it's corrosive to important American values beyond cheap dishwashers. Um, and, and then you have the folks on the top and, and the bottom of the Rubik's Cube is then sort of the global warming pandemic, um, you know, downsides of, of globalization crowd writ large. And they at least politically seem to me to be joining to a large extent with, with the top of the Rubik's Cube folks. That is that most of them I don't think actually would do anything about globalization unless you get to like the hardcore degrowthers. They're mostly kind of flying to places like Davos and ask, asking what constraints we need to put on all of those people concerned about the sides of the cube to make sure that things don't get messed up. Um, and, and so I think you have, you know, one way of looking at it is people who are very concerned with the concrete and the specific that they see happening within people's lives versus people who are much more interested in, in the abstract. Um, but I, I think maybe the best way to understand it, and, and this really goes to one of the strengths of, of the book, which is in the focus on trade-offs and competing values, is that we have a sequencing issue. That, that ultimately the people around the sides of the Rubik's Cube like the idea of many of the things that come with globalization. They like cheap dishwashers too. They like foreign foods, They you, know, you name it. Uh, most of them don't actually object to immigrants when you talk about an actual person they know and might be friends with. Uh, they're, they're not actually xenophobic, but what they would say is you need to prove that you can operate this country and this economy in a way that is going to work for everybody and, and maintain a, a high level of social equity uh, before you get to do any of that. Um, and, and the folks at the top of the Rubik's and the bottom of the Rubik's Cube seem to me to be saying the opposite, that, that what is most important is we preserve these values of openness, that we tackle climate change, that we sort of aspire to these values uh, and, you know, we, we're going to try to bring everybody along, but we're certainly not going to slow down on their behalf uh, and, and we'll mail them checks if we need to. And, and so I think that's a, a useful way of understanding the both the fight over globalization and then certainly the American political divide uh, that we increasingly see emerging. Uh, and, and I think, again, the, the book in just all the different ways it walks through these sides, but then also which of them overlap, where do they conflict? 
um, just does a, a wonderful job of, of, of teasing it out. So, so congratulations to Nick and, and Anthea. And, and again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, turn to Ruth. Thank you so much. Let me add my thanks um, to Orens, uh, both to um, Professor Alford for convening this um, and to uh, the authors, the co-authors, um, Nicholas and Anthea. So this, this book took me back many years to, to my first class with Professor Alford. And um, there, there were many wonderful moments in that class. This was a, a class on, um, on international trade, the GATT system, and, and we covered NAFTA a little bit as well. And it was really my first introduction to theories of free trade and to what was then becoming where the book picks up, right? This celebratory moment um, in, in world history where we seem to have converged on what I call, um, um, you know, newfound religion, right? We, we, we all believed that um, globalization would, would really flatten our differences. It would, it would propel us to not only better material conditions, but that we would be better people that somehow money was the solution. And, and in the book, um, uh, the authors really, I, I think, hit at this, not as hard as I would have wanted them to, but really sort of say, you know, in quoting Michael Sandel and, and some um, um, other scholars that, that in fact, the, the materialist emphasis that fueled this newfound faith, this almost frenzied faith in globalization um, obscured many of the fundamental differences that were chipping away at the foundations, both of what made us um, um, as a nation more cohesive um, and certainly um, uh, did not do much for the international institutions that had really um, been the center of these discussions about the, the benefits of free trade. And so uh, I was reading the book and, 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 and looking back and thinking both about my own reactions as a student, reading this and thinking, well, first of all, there are huge swaths of the world that aren't reflected in this debate. And in fact, the system, it, it's, it's an irony to me that the book actually um, reveals so poignantly the system itself being unable to extricate from any of these narratives. When you think about free trade, we don't think about free trade from the lens of the colonial experience and the ongoing effects of colonialism. Um, we don't think about free trade theory or its benefits um, from the perspective of minimum wage earners and those who are unschooled, um, um, in, in fact, rates of illiteracy in, in many parts of the world going up. And we just certainly don't think about free trade from the perspective um, of those who adhere very fundamentally to a core set of religious beliefs. I mean, so there's a whole swath of really important historical and current um, perspectives and codes, if I might use the word, that underscore and in some ways pull away from these six narratives. Um, some of the narratives absorb some of them. So, you know, the, the right wing populist narrative is often at least rubbing against some components of, um, of the faith life in, in America in particular and in some parts of Europe. Um, uh, the anti-corporate often is rubbing um, and overlapping a bit, as the co-authors point out, with with left wing, um, with a left wing populist narrative. But but to Oren's point, at which with which I very much agree, um, the points of these rubs actually end up reinforcing um, some of the core tensions uh, between the two, even as they both end up in the same place ultimately. In, in some ways. Um, what I think is, was a really masterful depiction of these narratives, what they have in common, what they have apart, um, and the importance of an integrated approach to thinking about, about free trade made me ask the question, um, and it's a question I hope the co-authors will, will address, um, do we really need a consensus on economic globalization? Perhaps the merit of these six narratives is that they force us to identify the cleavages in what we pretend to be values that hold us together when in fact they are 
many, in many instances, values that are simply irreconcilable. Um, and that perhaps it is, it is the reliance, the deployment of narratives that has made it so comfortable um, for them to appear in much more tension than they in reality are. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to push a little bit on, on some themes and in particular the, the chapter on trade-offs um, and thinking about what the trade-offs really are because I, I wonder myself um, about this. First, um, there are multiple identities. So as you note in, in the book, um, uh, people have strongly held convictions about what it means to be American and what America's role is in the world. This isn't just the work of intellectual elites. It's not even re reserved for universities. Um, rural farmers in Iowa and professors in elite institutions both have a distinct vision about why America is special and why America is different. And they may come at it in very different ways and they may reach different conclusions about what that specialty means or what that distinctiveness ought to serve. But the reality undergirding both of these perspectives is that America is different. And that that difference ought to propel us to do things differently, to resist globalization or to embrace it. Um, but it's the, the foundations are the same. And, and, and so when, when we talk about these six narratives, I wonder how national identity, um, religious identity, and economic identity, and the fact that these exist in a continuum, not really as separate silos, um, and shape what we think globalization ought to accomplish is, in fact, a, a really significant challenge. And, and I found that um, I, I kept going back to this as I was reading the chapter on trade-offs, because think, for example, um, the conservative evangelical coalition. Um, in many ways, very pro-trade, very pro-globalization, because these are the streams that opened up the world for much of the um, of, of, of organized churches outreach, whether it's Catholic ministries, whether it's orphanages, whether it's humanitarian aid, the capacity to participate on a global stage was made possible by globalization. But if you put that group in the same room, say for example, with a left-wing populist, they look like they, they're, they're, they look completely different. They, they are, they are uh, roomfuls of foxes and hedgehogs, but fundamentally, they're all just wearing costumes. And so I, I really wonder um, about whether these narratives are, are more of a continuum than they are really different pieces of even the same thing. Um, and so that was just one example I wanted to, to, to put out there, that the multiple identities that um, the, the, those who are in, engaged in any one of these narratives where means that as we twist this Rubik's cube, um, they can flip depending on where in the continuum the issue is that concerns them the most. That leads me to a, a second major point that, that I, I'm hoping that our discussion will, 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 will um, uh, produce and that is views of the state. Um, the narratives don't really, none of these narratives engage the role of technology significantly. None of these narratives view technology as a form of production, both for power and for social um, uh, cohesion. And that means um, that there is some tension between each of these narratives and how it views the state. Should the state intervene in the market and to what degree and, uh, and, and, and to what purpose? Is it to make the rules fairer? Is it to, to ensure that there's equitable access? Um, or should the state be actively involved in the design of legal regimes that in fact make globalization more feasible and the fruits of it less equitable? So just, just to, to give an example, intellectual property, which is the area in which I work. When I first arrived at Harvard Law School many years ago, there was not a single intellectual property class on the curriculum. There were one or two classes taught by adjuncts at night for engineers who wanted to go to the patent office. 
intellectual property didn't exist. And I remember arriving at Harvard Law School, desperately wanting to study intellectual property law because I had come uh, through a series of studies and, and reading to understand that the patent system was going to be a significant source of economic power for any state that was willing to invest in it. Now, in, 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 the, in the narratives, we talk a lot about, the, the authors talk a lot about ch the, the China-US face-off. Well, intellectual property is right at the center of this face-off. China made it a goal to become the number one patent producing office in the world. And it accomplished that and continues to hold that record today. It's, 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 it's speed towards embracing, pursuing technology as a means of benefiting from globalization is unparalleled. And when you look at the history of intellectual property in the United States and you look at the history of intellectual property in China, radically different histories. Both, however, pursuing the exact same ends with the exact same means, intellectual property rights. Now what's happening is this is setting unfolding against a backdrop of harmonization, where rules of law and rules of administrative process for obtaining technology through patents, the entire CRISPR battle between, between um, Harvard and Berkeley was in fact a microcosm of a fight between um, the US and the EU. When you look closely at what was happening and the fight over who would own this frontier edge technology, it, it had all kinds of geopolitical ramifications because of the kind, because of the markets that would be affected by this radical technology. And the narratives, I find the six narratives, um, uh, all in some ways address these core questions fundamentally um, for the same ends. How can we make this distinct phenomenon of the state, um, this political instrument operate in a way and in a manner that produces the outcomes that will reinforce our core values. So it's not so much that there are differences in values, it's that we want the state to use its power to regulate in order to make us winners, not winners economically necessarily, but winners ideologically, winners in terms of our values, winners in terms of our vision of what the state is for, that the state is to serve our interests and we believe our interests ought to trump those of others. And that, competition among and between values um, struck me. You mentioned it in the book and I thought it was one of the most actually um, really powerful um, dimensions of your analysis that this is that there are fundamental values for which we need a robust public discourse to tease out where our differences are and where our points of convergence might be. And I think what I wanna suggest is that views of the state are not just political views, they're not just economic views, they're views about values. What's the role of the state in helping consolidate the values that I hold dear and ensuring that the world is set up in a way that makes the benefits of those values not only visible to me, but also um, out there in the world visible for others to embrace and to see. The last thing I wanna say, cause I know my time is up. Um, uh, Katerina Pistor in her book, um, uh, in her 2019 book, you know, talks a lot about how law is so central to inequality. And again, to use intellectual property laws as an example, um, uh, when you think about what we define as an intellectual property asset, what is tradable as an intellectual property asset, it's all based on what the law decides. And so the law decides that the knowledge of an indigenous group in Brazil um, who understand the power of a Brazilian venom um, to cure um, certain expressions of Parkinson's disease is just traditional knowledge. It, it is in the public domain and should be freely accessible. But if that venom is extracted with the help of the indigenous group and it ends up in a, in a lab and, it's, and, and, and um, a, a patent is filed for, all of a sudden it becomes a tradable asset. And the role of law in each of these six narratives is actually quite muted. And I'm hoping the authors will speak to this um, because right-wing populists and left-wing populists both think of law in the same way. In other words, their reverence for it, their use for it, their sense of its value are actually quite the same. And yet we know that law can be designed, whether it's by the corporate power narratives or those who, the geoeconomic 
power block um, from that narrative that law is often designed to consolidate power and to consolidate the capacity to generate wealth. We've seen that with intellectual property. We're seeing that with climate change. We're seeing that with tax. We're seeing that with corporate law. And I was really um, concerned about the trade-offs because one of the trade-offs that the book doesn't get into, but, but it hints at, is that the legal systems that we design to facilitate trade really rest on conceptions of the law that ignore the capacity of the law to create winners and losers disproportionately above any market because the market trades on what the law decides is an asset or is a property, right? And so I think what I wanna end up with is, is just something that the authors say that really made me um, think so deeply and I'm so grateful for this book. The first, these narratives are important because they do obscure real values. And we need to go beyond what people say to understand what they're thinking and why they're feeling um, the way they do about globalization. But I think also what the narratives tell us is that the notion of equality itself is not neutral. That we all think we want equality in a particular way, um, but it's only equality that's produced by the values that I believe in that we really desire not by the values that others want. And I think that fundamental tension is something that the authors really begin to help us think through um, and to see if there are ways in which we can design laws, when in ways in which the role of the state can be reconceived and ways in which the idea of equality is both about um, values and about the capacity to distribute wealth, not only from the surplus, but from the productive power that law might otherwise give those who um, feel left out. So I'm gonna stop there and let the next week go. Well, thank you, Ruth, that's amazing. Uh, as always, uh, thank you so much. And we'll turn to Anne-Marie as our third commentator. You all will need to write a new book just to respond to us <laughs> at this point. Uh, first of all, I just have to say that I love being back at Harvard Law School, even virtually. I can see friends uh, and the participants and. Ruth, you mentioned Katerina Pistor, who was our colleague briefly, and, and I knew well when she was at Harvard. So it's, it, it feels good to be back, even in this format. And I also love the book. I won't spend a lot of time at, sort of going through specific arguments. The audience has heard, I hope, enough uh, to, to want to read it. I mean, I will say the nuance of it and the range and really the, the, your ability to move back and forth from the geopolitical to the, not quite the personal, but certainly the individual level, as well as, as across an astonishing range of sources. It's just wonderful. As I was reading it, I thought I could teach an entire class, at least a six week class, just on this book. I mean, close reading and looking at, at your extraordinary range of sources, you would, you would get a tour of the world uh, if, from multiple perspectives. And you are, it's also very colorful. Obviously you talk about a Rubik's cube, you move from Rubik's cube to kaleidoscope. It's a little dizzying at times, um, but, but it works well. And then you have, as you say, a whole menagerie and that's gonna be the jumping off point for my comments. Your um, chapter is called Globalization for Foxes. And you start and you say in this book, we have used the shape of elephants, the color of swans, and the vision of dragonflies to illuminate the problems of global inequality, uh, the importance of perspectives from outside the West and the skill of integrating multiple lenses to create a more three-dimensional view of reality. And then you say, and I, you go on to add two more animals to your menagerie, the hedgehog and the fox, uh, obviously from my, Isaiah Berlin's famous hox, fox and hedgehog. And you, you, this, this is a Fox book, right? It is a book that integrates so many different things. It is definitely a Fox book. And you actually recommend a Fox outlook. And I just want to read again for a moment. Uh, on 281, you say, um, yet a debate dominated by hedgehogs may be unhelpful in moving us forward. Uh, particularly when there's so much about economic globalization in question. Hedgehogs roll up into a ball of spikes when they are threatened. Uh, and then you go on to say that's the way a lot of people respond uh, to, to critique. 
Uh, and instead, you argue that you really need the Fox perspective of not trying to oversimplify uh, and to accept these multiple shifting narratives and the shifting politics and, Ruth, I would agree, identity uh, and global perspective among them. So I want to challenge you on this. I am an avowed, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably, I, I'm not sure I'm a fox or a hedgehog, but of the two, I, I really do love the big synthesis. Uh, and I want to suggest that actually there's a hedgehog way of looking at all of this that makes sense of your narratives in a different way. Um, so as you know, I published a piece over the weekend essentially arguing that the 21st century needs a globalist perspective, a people-centered perspective. We can argue about whether, whether globalist is the right term, but a people-centered perspective rather than a state-centered perspective. And at the end, I actually talk about precisely the two meta-narratives that you say at the end of the book may shift all of this off the table which is China on the one hand and climate change on the other. And that is exactly how I framed my argument, which is that although the Biden administration says it wants to solve all these global problems and it doesn't want a new Cold War with, Ch with China, in fact, the lure of superpower rivalry and just what it takes to engage in that rival rivalry tends to crowd everything else out. And so whatever they say, I'm looking at this White House going, this looks a whole lot like this is the era of great power competition, which was Trump's national security strategy. And it isn't just any great powers, it is two great powers, and that that's going to squeeze other things out. And that whole point of view, that whole set of perspectives is shaped by the Cold War, but it's shaped even more by a Westphalian status vision of international relations. And I would like to suggest that, you know, that the Westphalian system that was four centuries it took of course a long time really to develop and we're now heading into a people-centered politics which is also a planetary politics but here's where I want to, to sort of challenge you so you say and said on Twitter today which I was grateful for you say you know my view is one of the narratives it is the global threat narrative right that that's one of the narratives of um uh, of globalization and so of course climate change is exhibit a but pandemics but i would also include global inequality cyber security criminal networks I, there are all sorts of, of of threats i think though that the people-centered perspective actually encompasses most of your narratives, right? It encompasses, I've got to look, I can't show, but there is an absolutely brilliant uh, place toward the beginning of the book where you manage to find six economist covers uh, that, uh, that, that each captures uh, the, the, um, the different uh, narratives. And let me just see if I can find it because I need to refer to it, hold on. Yeah, come on. It's on page 15. Thank you. Got it. Okay, so so here's what I would say. If you look, the, there are two narratives. There's one that is clearly statist, right? The geoeconomic narrative is the US v China. It is clearly statist. And you could say, you even could say uh, less so US v Russia, uh, but even US EU tensions are geoeconomic. And I think the establishment narrative, the on the up, everything is good, is also mostly statist. It's mostly assuming all boats rise, although uh, taking chapter from uh, or a leaf from, from Ruth's remarks, I would say, again, that's a highly Western and Northern uh, perspective of all states. But I want to suggest all the rest are people centered. And this actually sort of touches on how Oren saw the four sides where the left-wing populists, the right-wing populists, uh, the corporate power and global threats, all of those look below the surface of the state. They are all looking at people. 
And if you took my perspective that said, look, we, it's not that I think governments are going to disappear. Of course they're not. But I want to evaluate, I want to stop seeing them as the, you know, the realist black boxes. I want to look at the impact of all these actions on people first and diagnose the problem that way and think about solutions that way. That would apply to whether you were checking corporate power or you were addressing the real lived experience, as Oren said, of so many people who are on the, the losing side of globalization, or if you were thinking about climate change as the global threat and you, you have to look to mayors and corporations and civic groups, um, that all of those uh, are in fact uh, globalist or let, let's say people-centered narratives. Now, if that is true, then I think that's a kind of hedgehog frame. It's a, and maybe, maybe the, the, the animal analogies led us down here. Let me shift ground because you also talk about synthesis and the importance of synthesis and you cite Howard Gardner on on thinking about you know the value of of a powerful synthesis so i would challenge you then to say look i think there this statist or state centered versus people centered are syntheses of these different narratives in a way that still help people because as much as i agree with you that we need to deconstruct the realities of politics are people look for dichotomies, right? They look for ways that they can make sense of the world. I prefer to see the world in, in threes rather than twos. And so sometimes you can get there that way, but that, that you don't wanna leave everyone with these deconstructed narratives all over the table. They're too easily hijacked and it doesn't then give you a place to stand as you try to put the different pieces together for solutions. Um, so again, I would, I would close, because I actually really do want to hear your, your responses um, by saying that there's a tension between the kind of thinking you call for, which is synthetic, and where you leave us on content, which is deconstructed. Uh, and I, I, for one, would prefer the synthesis that still allows the richness and complexity of your narratives. Great, great. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So uh, over to the authors, and I think we start with Anthea. And there we are. <laughs> That's exactly the slide. And there you're still on mute. <laughs> yes, yeah, so are you, am I hearing now? Yes. Um, so they were an extraordinarily rich set of comments, no chance to do justice to all of them. These are the six narrative uh, covers of The Economist that Anne-Marie was just talking about. What I wanna do actually in response is a lot of this is gonna be about realignment. So I wanted to show you something which isn't in the book, but it's something we've been thinking about exactly on this issue about realignment to see whether it makes sense. So we had sort of thought about these as win-win and lose-lose, but Oren, to your point, we were sort of grouping on the left now, left-wing populist and corporate power, and on the right, more of the right-wing populist and geoeconomic on our, on our win-lose. And when we started to do it this way, we realized that actually many of these correlate with different kinds of images we see a lot. So for example, the what we call hockey sticks and crosses. So the hockey stick of economic growth tends to go with the win-win establishment narrative, but you have a similar hockey stick of um, carbon emissions, but this time it goes to the lose-lose. So we've got these two hockey sticks of runaway growth and runaway emissions. But in this middle layer, we're concerned more with relative stuff. And so that's where we're looking at the individual level or country level with crosses. And so you have um, on the one hand, on the left-hand side, often a real concern about inequality. So you see these sorts of crosses of top 1% up and top 50% down. Whereas on the right-hand one, the essential concern partly is about inequality for the right-wing populace, but a lot of it is also about inter-country competition, Anne-Marie, to go to your point. And so you often see it with these sorts of graphs of the US going down and China going up. And one of the things we thought was sort of interesting once you start to sort of reconceptualize this as hockey sticks and crosses is you can also then see it being played out in some other parts of the world. So if you think about China, for example, with the common prosperity, but also the crackdown on big tech, 
that's an example where there's something similar going on to what we're seeing in the West. Whereas when you think about the geoeconomic narrative, we're seeing something similar from China, but, but the roles are flipped. And so we start to see what we think of as the against Western hegemony narrative, the decline of the US. But Ruth, to go to your point, I think underneath all of this, um, there are still a lot of neglected perspectives that, that are just not featuring much in the Western debates at the moment. So I just wanted to share those as just as a starting point to think, um, to think about sort of where we are in this debate, which is really at this point of realignment. And I think we're all trying to work out kind of what is the configuration going forward for that realignment. And there are many sort of narratives that are starting to see uh, coalitions being developed. And I think that's part of the realignment going forward. And there are also, Ruth, to your point, clear blind spots and biases in these Western debates. I really want to pick up, though, um, towards the end, this sort of question about identity and about people and planet, because I think that this is um, a, a set of profound questions that sort of are, are going to kind of be on the cards as we do this politically. So I completely agree, Ruth, with your analysis that we all have multiple identities. And with one of my colleagues here at the ANU, Miranda Forsyth, we've been calling this kaleidoscopic identities. And it's almost like if you have a Venn diagram of all your different identities, not only do you have these different communities that you're sort of part of, but a lot of the question is like, which one tends to be triggered so that it comes to the surface and becomes your dominant identity at a particular point in time. But I think, Amory, this does actually then relate to your people and the planet um, comment. So one of the things that we found in some of the psychology literature was that people's sort of sense of identity often had different sizes of communities. And on the, you sort of say, well, localism, globalism, there's no real difference. They're both people-centered. But this was actually something we found often highly correlated with people that were on the left that tended to think we're, we're all similar and it doesn't matter if it's local or global, it's, it's, it's sort of all in the mix. Whereas what we actually found from some of the stuff um, on, on the right side was a, a smaller circle of concern or care, which was more kind of family first, community first, then country. And I, I don't think that that's um, taken nearly as seriously by many people on the left. And it sits uncomfortably with what's happening on the left. And I think that's actually part of what you see, not just with the right wing protectionist narrative about sort of cultural values and wanting to, to keep some of that sort of integrity of um, a particular country. But I think it's also partly what you're seeing underlying the geoeconomic narrative. So I think that your way of arguing for people and planet is, is a brilliant articulation, but it still strikes me as an articulation that comes very much from the left. But I would say what I take on board very strongly from you, which I think is right, is that um, you can think about the global threats one, not just as a global threats, but as a global opportunities. And that I think your framing about people and planet is about not just threats, but about opportunities and that that's really um, a wonderful one. Um, one other point that has come up from this is really about the role of law. And this is a question that we've asked ourselves and we've also asked ourselves because we're legal scholars. And in some ways, this is a book that uh, on the surface does not look like it's about law. And there would be an enormous amount we could do. And Nicholas is actually doing this in his trade law class of actually now organizing his trade law class according to these narratives to actually teach kind of the different perspectives and then where they come out in the law. And Ruth, you could just do this beautiful job after that of doing a critical deconstruction. I think that would be a really interesting course on globalization. But it's also made us think about what is the role of law? And one person made the point to us that when we do integrative complexity, where you first differentiate narratives and then you integrate, there actually, there are two different kind of legal functions going on there. The first is almost the adversarial function of taking different sides and arguing the different sides, and that's your differentiation mode. But then the integration mode is actually not law as advocate, but law as mediator or law as judge, which is that integrative mode. And so one of the things we wondered whether, even though the book isn't about law as subject, in some ways it might be illustrative of law as method in, in a different sort of way. We don't have long left, so let me pass across to Nicholas to get his views on this. That was uh, an incredible rich set of responses, so, so I, I won't be able to do justice to any of it. I just wanted to pick up first on, on um, and Mary Slaughter's point that we are not doing synthesis in the book, and it's, it's true. It's simply, I think, um, where we saw our comparative advantage, uh, we, we are 
obviously limited in, 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 in the depth and our depth of understanding of all these of the economic issues of the um, cultural issues that that are involved here and so focusing on the narratives helped us uh, uh, it's something that we thought we could contribute to the debate to provide this map and to kind of provide the ground for others to take it and, and develop exactly the, the kinds of tendencies that, that we're hoping for. And maybe we can make um, small contributions to that. Like I'm thinking about that in the context of trade, how, how could you design a trade policy that would actually be responsive to the different uh, concerns promoted by the different narratives. But, but it's, that is a very limited contribution to, compared to what we thought we could, we could help in terms of mapping the debate. Um, Oren, I, I was really struck by your comments about um, the four narratives being um, actually very close to each other or, or is something that um, is something that that um, many would support and I think that is actually um, a success um, if, if you can put it that way of, of the way in which we're trying to, to, to present the narratives and we're trying to present them um, in a way that that makes them um, sympathetic and in fact it was our experience when we wrote the narratives that we started seeing truth or seeing something valuable in each of the perspectives. But if you look at the way they actually play out in, in public debates, you often see them portrayed in, in, very, in very caricatured ways. So, so I think that these commonalities are not necessarily seen. Maybe they, they will, they're seen by people who read them when the narratives are presented in this way. But if you look at public debates, uh, you often see the caricatures of, of these different uh, points of view. And so, um, I, I'm just wondering whether whether that's not um, actually um, a, a very, something very promising. If, if you think that, and, and it's, it's true that we are seeing these funny new alliances currently in, in the U.S. between the right and the left. Um, we have the strong anti-materialist strand now on the right that was used to be more typical. Uh, on the left, you also see the funny alliances between uh, Tucker Carlson and the Chinese Communist Party in terms of um, embracing masculinity and, and um, reducing uh, video game playing. So um, it all seems to be up for grabs. But what, what is really decisive, I think, uh, and which is the point that we're trying to, to, to uh, make in the book, is that it all depends on how you approach the, the narratives. You can always caricature the other narratives. Uh, and, and, and often we attempted to do that. Uh, maybe especially with the establishment one but but there's what we really the message is don't do that because one if you don't do that if you try to put yourself into each other's shoes and and really try to see the the world from from from, from their eyes you will see things that you you agree with and that that can then provide the basis for the kind of synthesis that that um i think we're all looking for but that's all i have to all i have to say but thank you so much for engaging with the book Thank you, Nicholas and Anthea. I can't resist um, uh, asking one question uh, myself. And so I, I uh, adored the way in which you were uh, teasing apart uh, these different strands and helping us see uh, in the most generous way each. Uh, but as I was reading it, of course, I was also reading about the limited success of COP26. And I kept trying to reconcile the empathy of understanding each viewpoint with the absolute failure of the world to deliver on what you acknowledge in the book is, you know, potentially the most important existential crisis. And so I just wondered, uh, you know, maybe it's just too reductionist in my part, or it's the next book. Um, uh, but, um, you know, uh, what guidance uh, one would offer for COP27 or whatever for um, translating uh, this rich empathetic appreciation of different perspectives and the capacity to see uh, the humaneness uh, and as several, as each of our commentators said in their own way, the, the human dimension, something I've always tried to do in my teaching, but, but uh, you know, ultimately there needs to be some kind of institutional vehicle or other way to address this overarching global dilemma. So I, we, we might run over a couple minutes, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. That is such a, an amazing and perceptive question. So um, one of the things that has dawned on me this week, because I always like to think ahead about next books, is I feel like there are sort of two next books, at least for me, coming out of this. Uh, the first one is a thinking book and the second is a doing book. So the thinking book is 
how do you, I'm calling it at the moment, how do you think global, which is how do you think not just in more global ways, but also with these more um, sort of systemic ways where you zoom up and down and in and out and see from different perspectives, because this is something I think we don't teach. And it's also something I think, interestingly, you're much more likely to be uh, conscious of and do if you are sort of a third culture intellectual in some ways. So if you've moved countries, you've moved disciplines, you're a first generation immigrant, all sorts of things. So I think there's a really interesting thing about like, how do you think globally and what might that mean for education? Um, but the second thing I have, and this is a project with a colleague here, Miranda, is thinking about how do you do governing in complexity? Because we're in such a complex and uncertain world and we're seeing it most particularly in the climate crisis, but also in the trade and investment regime, is I think we need very different adaptive, flexible approaches, catalytic approaches to trying to govern in complexity. And so we've got a variety of work where we're doing this in the trade and investment space at the moment, but we're looking across at, to, at what's happening with the climate change regime and the very, very different type of institutions and structures that you have in order in a very complex world, but also a highly contested world to think how do you move forward in those circumstances? So you've kind of hit the nail on the head about at least my current thinking about where the next two books might be, but don't hold me to that, things always change. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, we hope to have uh, Anthea back here in the spring for a brief couple of days. Maybe we can get her and Nicholas uh, to uh, uh, offer us more on the, on the next project. Uh, maybe before we close, let me just open again to our three wonderful panelists to see if you have any last observations or questions to leave uh, for Nicholas and Anthea. I have one well, final comment, no. but I first go. go. Uh, so I have a, th this will be a long ongoing debate, probably on Twitter and perhaps el elsewhere. I'd just say that I, I think the, the, the people-centered view is as much local as global. Indeed, I think actually, if you once you leave the construct of the state, you are as free to go toward mayors or smaller communities and start there with what they want. And that also goes to much smaller states as you are to be global. I de definitely think that just thinking in global terms, I, I, I take your point. It's, it's politicized, but also just too abstract. Uh, so the question is, can you think about people-centered politics in ways that actually work? And that to me is something to be worked out. And I do think your, your narratives are hugely helpful. Thank you, thank you. And Ruth or Oren before closing? I, I would only add to that that, um, at some points in the book, and, and this is Anthea's point about future books, um, at some points in the book, I thought you were, you pulled back, um, you were more muted than the lead up um, would have suggested about how significant the underlying values are and how important it is to engage frontally in these value combats. Um, and so I was just going to encourage you to say, you know, it was bold to do even the degree to which you did it, but to say that was just, I thought, remarkable. It was remarkable intellectual honesty. It was remarkable political honesty. Um, and it's exactly what we need um, across the board. It, it, we're not going to make progress without really challenging and exposing and talking about these things that we believe and hold so dearly, but that we hide behind these veils um, that we describe as narratives. And I just wanted to say thank you and to challenge you to, to, to let it all out, um, you know, the next round, let it all out. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just very briefly pick up on, on the point Anthea made at the end about governance, because I think, you know, something that struck me in the book is that um, you describe the, the sort of pro-globalization top of the Rubik's Cube is as being very focused on, on the country as the unit. Um, and that was maybe the one thing in the whole book that just rang false to me, because it, it seems to me that it's really the refusal to acknowledge the importance of the country as a unit that characterizes uh, that dimension. And, and I raise it here because I think it ties so much into the governance question. I do worry that we are headed down a parallel path on questions of governance that we went down over the last 30 years on markets, which is asking the very technocratic question of how what seems that like the best solution to a problem without engaging sufficiently on the political economy question of what it will mean for different groups of people to assign 
uh, those roles and responsibilities at different level. And I suspect we will see what well, we see a little, we saw with Brexit, I guess would be the first example of this, an even stronger uh, backlash against efforts at global governance than, than we have seen uh, about global markets. And, and I would say it would be um, at least if not more rational. So I, I would look forward to reading the, re reading the, the six faces of, of global governance as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think Oren, uh, absolutely right. At the top, uh, one of the challenges is harnessing corporate power that transcends boundaries. I should note before turning back to Anthea and Nicholas for last word, we had originally thought of doing this the night before, the 16th, but Oren uh, wrote and said he uh, goes to a, the school committee uh, uh, in his town and uh, he's living the values he talks about, that that transcends globalization or prestige of Harvard, whatever, to be a part of the local community. Anyway, let us turn back to Anthea and Nicholas for uh, a last comment to wrap up this session. And again, let me reiterate, uh, Anthea, we hope uh, we'll be back and Nicholas as well in the spring briefly, and uh, maybe there'll be an opportunity to continue this discussion publicly as well as in the manner and reset. Well, I know we're over time, so I just wanted to say just very deeply, thank you so much, Bill, and to Harvard and to all the groups that helped to put this on. So we were very deeply grateful. And these sets of comments are, are both so rich and also so challenging, but also really supportive in terms of pushing our thinking on to go forward. So I just wanted to say very warmly and very, very earnestly, thank you. I, I still owe you an answer to your COP26 question. And one of the central struggles I had with the book is that we, we, we kept talking about how the hedgehog dominated the media environment makes it difficult like for moderate voices uh, or centrist voices to come to the fore when I thought, I don't want to be a centrist. I don't want to be moderate. It's not appropriate to be moderate given the times we're in. And so there was a real tension here for me. And so I think we need to be radical in, in terms of uh, in, in light of the time crisis and in light of the other change um, and other challenges that we're facing. But I think the key message is not, not to be timid, not to be incremental, but to be radical in a way that that takes people, all the people seriously who are going to be affected. And I think that's what, what, what Oren is saying, that even when we, when we look, focus on the climate crisis, we need to take everyone along and, and pay attention to the political economy and do unconventional stuff, uh, maybe um, like local content requirements, if that's what's needed to create the, the, the political um, support in order to, to have these solutions, then yeah, let's, let's just change the law and, and make that, that possible. And so I think that's the that's the challenge is to be radical in a way that is appropriate to the challenges, but in a way that that uh, takes everyone on board, has something to respond to to the concerns that everybody raises. So thank you so much for that opportunity to to discuss the book with you. We are big, huge fans of, of your work. And so uh, it was a real privilege. So thank you. Uh, thanks to our three panelists, our two co-authors. The book is only $35 uh, at Harvard University Press. And again, thanks to the library. Thanks to uh, Andre Barbeck and Sarah Zucker for arranging this. And let me also close by thanking our vice dean for the International Legal Studies Program and graduate program, uh, Gabriella Bloom, uh, without whom none of this would be possible. Thank you all very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.